I've spent most of my career studying Paul and his influence on Christianity. Now, I'm turning to Peter. I'm traveling to the land where his formation from humble fisherman to the Bishop of Rome took place. And I'm discovering for myself the places he influenced. Seeing this and seeing you break it just uh, makes sense of the word break, that he broke the bread. Following his path of most unlikely transformation. I'm Con Campbell and I'm in pursuit of Peter. I'm on the road again with Jack Beck. We're leaving Peter's observant Jewish neighborhood in Galilee in the rearview mirror, bound for an infamous pagan worship center at Caesarea Philippi. Jack may have preferred to hike, but fortunately my producer rented a car for us. Now, if you're thinking Caesarea sounds a lot like Caesar, you'd be right. The city is Roman in almost every way, and as pagan as any place in Israel. All right. So, Khan, we're, uh, we're at the base of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon just explodes here up to 9,262 feet. Caesarea Philippi, what we have of it, fits in the box below us here, below the ridge. So is the city exclusively before the edge of the cliff face? So from the cliff face towards us, that's where the archaeology is located. Now at this point, Peter's known Jesus a full three years, and I'm sure a bond is formed beyond that of mentor and student. But Peter's perspective was more than a bit incomplete, off the mark. He had to wonder why. Why did they come here? And you could excuse Peter for at least thinking, if not blurting out the words, what's going on, Jesus? Jesus has come to this center for pagan worship. Everything here would be abhorrent to a conservative Jew like Peter. The deities of the pagan world were more active and more powerful in certain locations than others. And this surreal looking place to them was a place where you could expect deities to be active. What you're standing on here would be full of worshipers of the deity Pan, whose statue is going to be tucked okay. in here. In fact, uh, Eusebius, the church historian, says this cave was the entrance to Hades. Many people made the trek here to worship the Greek god Pan. Pan was half human with the hind legs and the horns of a goat. His powers were said to rule over nature and especially fertility. The words panic and pandemonium have their origins in the myths surrounding Pan. The religious expression of Pan's worshippers played out in acts of raw lust and hedonism. I could easily imagine the scene to be deeply disturbing to Peter. Every norm of observant Judaism would be violated. A high point for Peter's discipleship of Jesus occurs here. You know, Jesus begins by asking them, who do people say that I am? Some of the disciples say, you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. And Peter finally nails it. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, fulfillment of Messianic prom promises. And that's a, that's a huge moment. And Jesus, in effect, says, you got it. Yeah, you got it. You got it. And, and I think that, that that powerful statement of you got it is because of where they are. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And he starts to hear answers that fit the Sea of Galilee context. Uh -huh. He says, mm, but what about you? And Peter's right there. Yeah. He's going, oh, I get it. Yeah. You want us to put the question in the right context. Uh -huh. You are the Christ. And then he adds the son of the living God. In contrast to everything that's claiming authenticity here, you're the real deal. Right. Jesus affirms what Peter said, and this is also a very significant statement. He says, this has been revealed to you by my heavenly father. And then he says, you are Peter. And remembering that Peter means rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And this is an extraordinary moment for Peter. Mm -hmm. Then the conversation takes a mm. turn because Jesus says, 
that he is going to be rejected by the chief mm -hmm. priests, mm -hmm. the elders, the scribes, the Jewish leadership. He is going to suffer and he is going to die. And Peter just cannot stomach that. Yeah. He can't take that. Peter says, whoa, 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 no, 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 Lord, that will never happen to you. Yeah. And this is a moment where right after Jesus has said, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church, he then says, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about this the right way. You, you feel that, that welling confidence in the student who gets it right. And, and then he gets taken from the front of the class to the very back of the room and punished right. for uh, making a suggestion about what ought to, to follow. It shows us that he's, he's partially got it, yeah. but he's still got some way to go. He does. All right, let's, let's take a look around. Peter must have been perplexed. Jesus confirms that he is Lord over all, including over pagan authority and pagan worship, and that he is above and greater than these surroundings. But then Jesus claims that somehow he'll be defeated by it? This would have made no sense to Peter. Well, thank you so much, Jack. And just as Jesus turned from this spot to head to Jerusalem, that's where I'm going next. Jesus' reputation had preceded him as he headed to Jerusalem for the Passover remembrance. And crowds from across Israel also gathered, calling out, Hosanna, the messianic phrase meaning, save us. And as he came into the city, the crowds laid down their cloaks and palm branches for him to ride on. And he descended the Mount of Olives See the descent here, coming down the Mount of Olives and then up into the city. So I'm sure that for Peter, this was a climactic moment, a moment of great expectations, a moment where, uh, full of excitement, where, where he would see the king finally enter Jerusalem and bring about this revolution that he had so longed for that he had been following Jesus for. But it's interesting that while Peter and others had that kind of expectation, Jesus seemed to have a different sort of expectation. Because he, he wept over the city. He knew that in only a matter of a few days, crowds would be chanting, crucify him, crucify him. That the city would reject her promised king. And so while he was weeping, the crowds were rejoicing. But soon we would see that Jesus' expectation is the one that would actually ultimately play out. As the crowds would turn against him, hand him over to the Romans and crucify him. Avner, Rachel, and their son David were my gracious hosts at the Passover Seder and were delighted to offer more than a meal and hospitality. They provided helpful understanding of the symbolism and significance of this Passover. This last supper Jesus would have with Peter and the disciples. So this looks like cranberry sauce. Well, it's pretty close. It's beets cut with horseradish. That horseradish is very strong. Uh -huh. Brings tears to your eyes. 
Okay. And the idea, Not in a good way. No. no. Right. And the whole idea is to remember the tears we cried when we were slaves. Uh. So it's a historical tool okay. to remember what we suffered as a nation. So this one makes you cry. Yeah. Yeah. I've got it. yeah. Okay. How normal is it to have a foot washing at a Passover meal? You would come in with very dirty feet, mm. and so there would be a, it would be required probably to have a, a nice dinner for everything not to smell terribly. And so the servants of the house would come and they would clean the feet of these people. They'd be walking around in sandals, so very dirty feet. Uh, and it's yeah. funny that you know it was Yeshua who did it for his disciples, which yeah. would probably not have been the norm. Which is why he focuses on the fact that if you want to be a leader, you have to become the servant of all. And I think that's something that Peter struggled with because he didn't want Jesus to wash his feet. Mm -hmm. um, in, I think, classic Peter style, you know. No, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. You know, I remember when I was studying also in, uh, in seminary and, and we were looking at that line from Mark where it says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, mm -hmm. but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Yeah. That message is still so radical. Mm -hmm. Now, and one of the messages of the Passover table is that anyone who's going to follow the Messiah of Israel is going to have to incorporate that in his life too and learn what it means to serve others. Yeah. Right. It was during this meal that Jesus told Peter that he, Peter, would deny knowing him three times. Peter scoffed and boldly claimed that he would go to prison and die for Jesus. But we have to wonder, just which version of Jesus was Peter willing to die for? The Jesus he thought he knew? Or the sacrificial saviour who suffered and even died? and spent three days in a burial cloth. After they shared the Passover meal together, Jesus' last supper, he came here to the Mount of Olives to pray, along with Peter, James and John. And Jesus asked Peter, James and John to keep watch while he went off to pray. And he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. So Jesus went to be alone for a time of solitude in prayer. And when he returned to his friends, he found them asleep shortly after that, a company of Roman soldiers approached in order to arrest Jesus. And while Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, Peter was determined to defend Jesus. He drew the sword. He struck off the ear of Malchus, a guard of the high priest. And Jesus healed Malchus and rebuked Peter. He said, Anyone who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And so we see that Peter has still not really understood what Jesus has come to do. He thought maybe this is the moment when he is going to show his strength, when he is going to overthrow these Roman soldiers and establish his kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that Peter has been waiting for. That's why he draws the sword. He still believes the kingdom must come by power. It must come by force. It must come by the sword. And he's not understood that Jesus has come to establish a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that will be established not by Jesus drawing the sword, but by Jesus accepting 
death at the hands of his enemies. And Peter has not yet understood this. He has not understood that the way to glory is through suffering. And so Jesus is taken away by the soldiers while Peter, James and John scatter. Peter followed the temple guards at a distance as they made their way to the home of the high priest. Once there, he stayed outside in the courtyard with the servants and kept warm by fire. Whatever Peter may have expected of Jesus' messianic role, they had grown as close as brothers, and now Jesus was in peril. But when a servant girl asked if he knew Jesus, Peter denied it. Perhaps he was still reeling from the stinging rebuke of his sword work during Jesus' arrest. Perhaps he thought that even now Jesus would perform a miracle and bring judgment on his enemies. We don't know Peter's motives. When another in the courtyard identified Peter as one of Jesus' disciples, he again denied it, this time with more urgency. He must have been making small talk around the fire because a little later, a group of those in the courtyard also accused him of being a follower of Jesus. They said his Galilean accent gave him away. This was simply too much for Peter. Everything was coming apart in front of his eyes. His leader had been taken, his friend arrested, and it looked like it wouldn't end well. So in response, according to the Gospel of Mark, he cursed. He swore an oath and quickly, coarsely declared that he did not know that damned man. In that moment, Peter fully rejected Jesus, refusing to be associated with him. And then, in the shock and the silence, a rooster crowed three times. Peter remembered with bitterness of soul what Jesus had said to him. Peter left the courtyard, out into the night, and he wept inconsolably. know what happened next. Jesus was tried and crucified. But Peter, the one who just hours earlier declared his allegiance to Jesus, was neither in sight nor in earshot when Jesus, in anguish on his cross, uttered the words, Father forgive them for they know not what they do.